Indy carries her pack even more carefully than before, and I wonder if something happened to her wasp nest during the, our crawl into the cavern. She brought the bag with her, and though she's thin, I don't know how she managed to protect it either coming or going into that space so tight. I don't know how she could have kept a fragile shell of a nest from being crushed. Something about this is story of Indy's mother and the boat seems strange, like an echo coming off the canyon wall and leaving part of the original words behind. I wonder how well I really know Indy, but then she ships her pack again and I have a sudden image of a fragile papery nest inside and the memory of the picture fallen to pieces and rose petals dry and light. I've known Indy since the work camps and she hasn't let me down yet. Kai turns around to us to hurry. Indy looks at him and I see an expression of likely hunger across her face. You smell the rain here before you see it or feel it. If Kai's favorite smell of the outer provinces is sage, I think mine is this rain. The smell ancient and new, like rocks and sky and river and desert. The clouds we saw earlier sail in with the wind and the sky turns purple, gray, blue. The sun goes down and we we'll reach the township. We can't stay here for very long, can we? Eli asks as we climb the path to the storage cave. And strip of lightning runs hot white between the earth and the sky and thunder cracks through the canyon. No, Kai says, I agree too. The danger of the society coming into the canyon now seems to outweigh what we face out in the plain. We'll have to move, but we have to stop in the cave, I say. We need more food, and Indy and I don't have any books or papers, and there might be something to find out about the rising. The storm should buy us a little time, Kai says. How long? I ask Kai. A few hours, Kai says. The society does not our only danger. The storm like this could cause flash floods in the canyon, and then we could cross the stream. We'd be trapped. We'll stay here just until the lightning stops. Such a long journey, and whether or not we find the rising could all come down to a matter of hours. But I didn't come to find the rising, I remind myself. I came to find Kai. And I have. Whatever happens next, we'll be together. Kai and I hurry together to the library cave, and it's piles of boxes. Indy follows us. There's so much, I say, overwhelmed as I open the lid of one of the boxes and see a pile of papers and books inside. This is entirely different kind of sorting. So many pages, so much history. This is what happens when society does not edit or cut or prune for us. Some pages are printed, many are written by different people. Each handwriting is distinct, different, like the people who wrote them. They could all Right. I suddenly feel panic. How will I know what matters? I ask Kai. Think of some words, he says, and I look for them. What do we need to know? Together we make a list, the rising, the society, the enemy, the pilot. We need to know about water and river and escape and food and survival. You too, Kai, says to Indy. A thing that has those words in it, put it here. He points to the middle of the table. At will, Indy says. She holds her gaze, his gaze for a moment and doesn't turn away at first. She does flipping open a book and scanning the pages. I find something that looks promising, a printed pamphlet. Where do you have one of those? Eli says. Vic found a whole pile of them. I put down the brochure and then I open a book and I'm instantly distracted by the poem. The first drop uh, like flakes, they drop like stars, like petals from a rose. When suddenly across the June, the wind with fingers goes. The poem where a hunter found the line from Sa for Sarah's grave. The page was torn out and shoveled back in. In fact, the whole book itself is out of order, falling apart almost as though it were head for the f for a fire on the rotation side with some one found it and put it all this little bones back in. Parts of it 
are still missing. The front cover seems to be ha have been improvised after the first one was lost. Now a plain square of heavy paper swollen over the pages. I can't find the name of the author anywhere. I turn the page to another poem. I did not reach the, but my feet slip near every day. Three rivers and a hill to cross, one desert and a sea. I shall not count the journey one when I am telling thee. A hill and then desert and a journey, it sounds like the story with Kai. Though I know I should be looking for other things, I keep reading to see how this might end. Two deserts, but the year is cold, so that will help the sand. One desert crossed, the second one will free as cold as land. Sahara is too little peace. I pray for the right hand. I would almost peace to be with Kai, I think. I know what the poem means. Though I don't know any about the Sahara. It sounds a little like Sarah and name of Hunter's daughter. But the child would be too high a price to pay for anyone's hand. Death, grandfather's death, back in Oria. A crust on a plate, a poem in a compact, clean white sheets, good last words. Death on top of the carving, black burned marks, wide open eyes, death down in the canyon, blue lines drawn, rain on girl's face. At the, and in the cave, rows and rows of sparkling tubes. It would never happen us, not again, even if the pull our bodies from the water and the earth and may us work and walk again. It would never be like the first time. Something would be missing. The society can't do this for us. We cannot do it for ourselves. There is something special, irreplaceable, about the first time living. I put one book down and picks up another. As he is he the one I loved first, or was it the boy who gave me my first real kiss? Every scrap Alexander has given me is a solid memory underneath, one so distinct I can almost touch and taste and smell it. I can almost hear it calling me back. Although I always thought Alexander was the lucky one to have been born in the burrow, not that I'm not so sure. So Kai has lost so much, but what he has is not small things. He can create, he can write his own words. Everything Alexander has written in his life, t tapped out on a port or a scribe, has not been his own. Others have always had access to his thoughts. When I meet Kai's gaze, the doubt I had a moment ago when he and Indy exchange glances disappears. There is nothing uncertain in the way he looks at me. What did you find? He asks a poem. I say, I need to focus better. So do I, Kai says. He smiles. The first real sorting is, I sh it shouldn't be so hard to remember. Can you sort too? I ask surprised. He never mentioned this before. It's a specialized skill. Nothing, not one of the most people have. Patrick taught me, he said softly. Patrick, the shock must register on my face. I thought Matthew would have been, would be a sorter someday, Kai says. Patrick wanted me to know how to. He knew I'd never have a good working assignment. He wanted a way for me to be able to use my mind once I couldn't go to school anymore. But how did he teach you? The ports would have registered if he showed you there. Kai nods. He figured out another way. He swallows. Glances across the cave at Indy. Your father told Patrick what you'd done for Bram. How you made it so that he could play games on the scribe. But Patrick, I gave Patrick an idea. He did something along the same lines. And the officials never noticed. He didn't have to use, he didn't have me use my own scribe. Kai says he traded for one from the archivist and gave it to me the day I got my work assignment in the Nutrition Disposal Center. That's how I learned about the archivist in Oria. Kai's face stills 
His voice grows far away. I know it looks, it's the way he looks when he says something that he hasn't talked about in a long time or even before. We know the assignment wouldn't be a good one. I wasn't surprised, but after the Fitchells left, I, he paused, I went to my room and got out the compass, sat there holding it for a while. I want to touch him, to hold him, to put the compass in his hand. Tears start in my eyes and to listen as he speaks even more softly now. Then I got up, put on my new blue plain clothes, and went to work. Adam Patrick didn't say a word, neither did I. He glances at me and I reach for his hand, hoping he'll want my touch. He does, his fingers tighten around mine, and I feel myself in another part of his story. This happened to him while I sat in my house on my the very same street eating my pre-made food and listening to the same port and daydreaming about the perfect life it would be delivered to me in the way everything always was. That night Patrick came back into the house with a black market scribe. It was old, heavy, with a screen so arctic it was laughable. The first time I told him it, to take it back, I thought he'd risk too much, but Patrick told me not to worry about it. He told me that my father had sent him a page of old writing after Matthew died. Patrick said he used that page for a trade. He told me that he'd always planned to use it on something for me. He went into the kitchen. Patrick thought the rumble of the incinerator would cover any sound we made. We stood where the port couldn't see us, so that's how he taught me how to sort, mostly without speaking. Just by showing me, I hid the scribe with the compass in my room. But that day, the officials came to take away all our artifacts. I say, how did you hide it then? I already traded the scribe when they came, he says, for the poem I gave you for your birthday. He smiles at me, his eyes back with me now back with me here in the outer providence. We've come so far. Kai, I whisper, that was too dangerous. What if they caught you with the poem? Kai smiles, even then, you were saving me. If you hadn't told me about the Thomas poem on the hill, I would never have gone to the archivist to exchange a scribe for your birthday poem. Patrick and I would have been caught. It would. It was much easier to hide a single paper than it would have been to hide a scribe. He brushes his hand along my cheek. Because of you, there was nothing for them to take when they came to the house. I'd already given you the compass. I put my arms around him. There was nothing for them to take because he had traded, given it all away for me. Neither of us speak for a moment. He shifts a little and points to the page in an open book before us. There, he says, River. That's one of the words we need. And there he says it with his, the way his mouth looks and his voice sounds. Makes me want to leave these papers alone and spend my days in this cave or in one of the little houses down by the water trying only to solve the mystery of him.